Good afternoon to you. Mark Scott of HurricaneTrack.com here. Time for the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. It's Thursday, the fourth day of November 2021. We've got a few things to talk about. Nothing too pressing, which is good news compared to where we were last year, but nevertheless, a few items on the agenda that are worth mentioning. So let's get on with it. First, we'll stop at the National Hurricane Center. That's a good first step here as we go forward. We still have Wanda up in the far north Atlantic, eh, pretty far north Atlantic, up near almost 42 degrees north latitude. That's getting it. That's pretty far up there, right? And about 39 degrees or so west longitude, 45 mile per hour wind. We'll show you a satellite animation of this in just a moment. It's still holding its own pretty good up there over the marginal sea surface temperatures that it's dealing with. And then in the eastern Pacific, another tropical depression Unbelievable how everything is just so different than the way it was last year. TD number 18E, of course the E is for Eastern Pacific. And this is what everything looks like satellite picture wise or a series of pictures put together. And you play them fast, you get an animation courtesy of Tropical Tidbits. There is Wanda. This is an interesting mess that's going to develop into a pretty solid coastal storm that's going to come across this area and then probably head out into the open Atlantic. I kind of like this look overall for winter weather, if you like that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, if it was sunny and 75 to 80 degrees everywhere, there would be a whole lot of people in the weather business that are unemployed. So, you know, you got to deal with the exciting and inclement and sometimes dangerous weather when it rolls around. And this is certainly an interesting look as we go towards winter if this keeps happening. I'll get to what I mean about that in more detail in a few minutes. There's TD number 18E in the Eastern Pacific. The uh, Caribbean, nice and clear, no issues there. Uh, we're pretty much done with the Atlantic hurricane season in terms of any impactful events. Yes, something could still be eked out, as they say, but I don't see it happening anytime over the next couple of weeks. Close-up shot of Wanda. Again, it's not doing too bad for itself up here in the far reaches of the North Atlantic Ocean, uh, between 40 North, which is right here, and what is that, 45 north, so it's moving on along there. Uh, a few spiral bands, some shallow convection. I mean, we're not talking deep thunderstorms here. There's no lightning in there at all being picked up. Uh, in fact, you can see on here, by the way, this animation is courtesy of the Weather Nerd site, but the GLM flash counter is a big fat zero. So, you know, the convection that it has, the thunderstorm activity, if you even want to call it that, well... It can't be a thunderstorm with no lightning, right? But it is some convection, and that is possible to have. The vertical rise of air into cumulonimbus clouds, there's just no lightning this time around, at least nothing being detected by the GOES-16 satellite, but it's still holding its own over water temperatures that are not very warm, but again, it's the cold air in the upper atmosphere that's creating the instability, and that's helping to generate what convection there is and pulled up the uh, sea surface temperature chart here from Tropical Tidbits. Uh, Wanda located roughly in this area in here. If I had to guess between Newfoundland and the Azores, that's pretty much where it's located. And if we look over here at the color scale, 22, 23, maybe 24 Celsius if we're being generous and just handing out temperatures. And we're talking low 70s Fahrenheit. So water temperature is not that high at all, not much energy there, but enough instability because of the cold air in the upper levels, as I talked about yesterday, that we have that. So there you go. Wanda will no longer really be, uh, it's, it's got a couple days left, and then that's it, pretty much. All right, in the eastern Pacific, another depression. Um, it's late enough now. I mean, this is November 4th. This thing is not going to do too well. It's kind of got an alien look about it already, sort of a weird shape. Um, I mean, honestly, it's getting late in the season. We're not supposed to have much activity in the eastern Pacific right now. But nevertheless, there it is. Uh, we'll track it, see what it's going to do over the next few days. Good news is no threat to Central America or Southern Mexico at all. And any swells that it generates are going to be just no big deal. So I'm not even too worried about that. But again, as I pointed out yesterday, I want you to notice, and this is very convenient for my example here, the center location, if you will, is right there at 90 degrees west longitude. 
and if you know your Gulf Coast cities, what other city is at 90 degrees west longitude along the Gulf Coast of the U.S.? Um, and we're talking about the Gulf itself, and that would be New Orleans. It's 90 west, 30 north, roughly. And so this is the same longitude, I pointed this out yesterday, that you would have it in the Gulf. And it's just it just happens to be uh, several hundred miles to the south and west of the Caribbean. So it's not that far removed. That's my, my point here. It's not like everything was way out in the Central Pacific, threatening Hawaii. We didn't have a bunch of super typhoons. It's a little unusual. You know, we're not really sure exactly what happened, why the season got kind of funky here, especially after Sam. Um, but it did, and it gave us a break. We kind of needed it. I would think we, we can all agree to that. It's exciting and interesting to track these things, but when they run over your neighborhood or your community and your house, it's not fun at all, trust me. So it's good to have a break, but you know, trying to decipher what, what exactly caused this shift. Well, I point out again, it's not that big of a shift. I want to go back to this, and we'll just go to the Hurricane Center here, uh, page. And just one more time to drive this point home. That's not that far removed overall. See what I'm saying? Just because it's divided by the land mass of Central America and Mexico, um, we consider it in a different basin. But that's just technicalities there. All right, moving from the tropics to lower 48 weather. Well, there you go. There's your sign of uh, winter coming. Some frost and freeze advisories now getting down more to the south, further, farther south, whatever. Carolinas, yep. Piedmont areas, the mountains have already had some frost and freezes. And once you've got or obtained or acquired or had or whatever, experienced, there's the word, once you've had experienced your first frost and freeze, that ends the growing season typically. And they don't keep issuing them because they're just going to keep coming. And so they being the National Weather Service. So this is the first frost and freeze of the new season, the new cold season. And it'll uh, essentially end the growing season for these areas. Not everywhere, but people that are really into this and keep up with tender vegetation, uh, farmers, greenhouse owners, whatever. If you're in the plant business, agribusiness, you know all about this. And so, yeah, it's a sign that uh, we're getting closer and closer to winter. I mean, we flip the clocks back this weekend. It's going to be dark at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Not that bad, but whatever. I like summer. Um, down here in Florida, I'll zoom in in a second and show you what this is all about. A little bit of color down there along the map. What does that mean? Well, let's just click in here and just kind of remind you that you can do this yourself. A nice interactive map here. We talk about crowdfunding. This is the probably the biggest crowdfunded weather site there is via our tax dollars. If I can get this to load, if it would only work, maybe it's my internet connection, or maybe it's the region that I'm clicking in. Let's just try out west, maybe their region. I don't know, maybe it's my weather, my, my connection, maybe it's the weather service. Who knows? It's not working, so we'll scroll. Oh, there it is, but I don't want Elko, Nevada. I want Florida. Ah, uh, when you record live, sometimes this will happen. Um, it's a coastal flood watch, is what it is, down here in Florida. Why? Well, we'll get rid of this because it's, it's failing me. <laughs> uh, because we're going to have a coastal storm develop here. This is the GFS, and you can see that takes shape right there. Comes out of the Gulf of Mexico over here, and you got high pressure up over the northeast. And then you got these northeast winds, this gradient that will develop, the difference in pressure over distance. That gradient will tighten up, as we call it. And there's going to be some brisk northeast to east-northeast winds across this corridor, the fetch off the Atlantic here. And Florida is in the way, so the water will pile up there a little bit, and you're going to get some coastal flooding issues, and that could be problematic. So let's see if it popped up. Nope, I, I abandoned it. Let's just try. I'm a sucker for wanting to prove my points and show my what I want to talk about. So let's see if I click on Northeast Florida. There we go. Thank you. So yes, maybe some rain, um, but the big deal is the coastal flood warning. See, this is why I'm glad I zoomed in. Uh, so some of these areas are going to have a flood warning. So the, the roads out near the beaches, those could get some overwash. 
high tide, we're getting towards what we call a perigean tide where the moon is new. So that means it's real close to the sun. You can't see the moon. The new moon is real close to the sun. The full moon is opposite the sun. There's some astronomy for you. But this is important because the perigee is when the moon is closest to the earth in its orbit. And so you get these perigean high tides. Uh, did you know that? That the moon has an elliptical orbit. It's not perfectly round. Sometimes during the month the moon is a little bit closer, so the tidal gravitational pull is a little stronger, and we get a little bit higher tides. That, with the onshore flow, has led me to this, to explain this to you. Coastal flooding issues. So take that into consideration in Florida, and as long as the weather.gov map works for you, you can pull this up, weather.gov, go in, click on it, and you get all this info here. Uh, farther to the south, uh, over a pretty good stretch of the Florida coastline, coastal flood watch. That's what that means. There's also rip current issues. Just not a good few days along Florida's east-facing beaches and, in some cases, the west-facing beaches because what I was showing you here, this low-pressure area that's going to develop, you'll have some onshore flow on the south side of that low. So, you know, in Florida, just take the next few days and chill out, read a good book, catch up on some binge watching of the 5,000 different streaming services that are out there, uh, including us. We got some stuff on YouTube, a few playlists. You can watch whatever, many different documentaries that I've got going back to 2004. But yes, seriously, it's going to be kind of a yucky few days. And you see those isobars in there, these lines of equal pressure? They're kind of tightly packed, I mean, more so than if they weren't, right? And so that does indicate some pretty strong onshore flow. Charleston Harbor could have some issues. Maybe some of the beaches uh, down there along the low-lying areas of the low country. That's kind of why they call it that. And then maybe even the outer banks here of North Carolina. A fairly impactful storm. And you know what? We do this again, let's say January or February, with some deep Arctic air. And it could get really interesting. You never know. Maybe some snow for our part of the world, where I live, in vicinity. We'll see about that. That seems to be harder and harder to come by these days. But this is the kind of pattern that if you can wrap in the cold air and it's deep enough through the atmosphere, it's not just shallow at the surface, that, at the surface giving you sleet and freezing rain, and all, mainly the freezing rain if it's shallow, um, that's no good. You know, if it's going to be cold, let it snow. Let the kids enjoy it. But that's way down the road. January or February, all right? Let's just wait. So that storm system moves through. A little bit of a disturbance down in the Western Caribbean, maybe bringing some squalls and just heavy rain for Central America. But that is just about it. If we just switch this over to the vorticity signature, that kind of helps us to see if anything's bundling. This is out at day five. We'll rewind the clock, see how it all evolves. There goes TD-18. There's the storm system um, that comes up through the Gulf and off the coast. That's what it looks like from the energy perspective, the vorticity, the spin in the atmosphere. And you can see that there's the different waves of energy that roll off of South America here down here at Columbia, and they drift over into the Pacific. Nothing ever really closes off, and that's about it. The euro, by the way, is a little bit stronger with our system. This is the 12Z Euro, just like that was the 12Z GFS. Here's the impulse here getting started today. A uh, little impulse already sitting out over the Atlantic. A lot of energy down there in the southern part of the country and the Gulf, which is still warm. I talked about this before, and here you go. You don't bleed the energy off with hurricanes. Well, we'll just do it with mid-latitude extratropical systems non-tropical, they, they more temperature contrast and baroclinic processes than warm core release of heat through condensation. Condensation is a warming process. This is just all meteorology. But you see what I mean? Big spread out system instead of a hurricane, which is more bundled and focused. These mid-latitude storms can be just as impactful yeah, sometimes as a low-end Category 1 hurricane and just over a large area. So the Euro painting a little bit more of a windy picture here. So we'll see. This is valid Sunday morning. By Monday, it heads out in the Atlantic. And what we'll be watching for 
just to kind of switch this up real quick, is to see if later in the year, uh, in the winter season anyway, do these systems cut up like that and give us some big snows and blizzards and whatever for New England or the Mid-Atlantic? We'll just have to wait and see. It's too early for that, though. We've got to get through Thanksgiving, then it can snow all at once. Uh, i got projects i got to work on and whatever, so we'll, we'll wait and deal with that later. Um, so that's it. You know, kind of short today, at least a little bit shorter than normal, because there's not a lot going on out there. But, as always, thank you for tuning in, whether it's short or long or anything in between. We try to cover what we can here, keep you aware of what's happening in the tropics and other interesting weather. That's what it's all about. Everything else going on in the world, at least you can stop by here for a little bit of, here's what's happening in the world of weather. All right, that's it for me. Have a great rest of your Thursday afternoon. Again, thanks for tuning in. I do appreciate your time and attention. I'm Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. I'll be back with more for you tomorrow.